Good. I see we have a nice audience uh, together. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Roger Magnarot, Chief of Staff at Solactive, uh, the Frankfurt index provider and financial technology firm. On behalf of Solactive, uh, welcome to our panelists and welcome to you uh, participants and attendees. I'm delighted to see many of you. Um, I don't actually see you, but I know that there's quite a few of, uh, of you in the in, in this webinar. Today marks the conclusion of a wonderful series of uh, five webinars we took in the fall uh, that got us to talk to, to a number of fascinating topics from corporate response to sustainability, to proxy voting in the role of proxy voting in stewardship. Um, the series has been a great success. I'm delighted to announce that we're going to have another one in the fall. And right now, I would like to welcome you all and welcome our panelists to this uh, session. Um, below me, or on my left, depending on how you look at the screen, uh, is Max, Max Horster. Max is the uh, managing director and uh, head of ISS Climate Solutions uh, Business Institution Shareholder Service. Before that, Max was a managing partner of Climate Neutral Investments a company of the South Pole Group, which was acquired by ISS. Uh, amongst major accomplishments, Max developed uh, an industry-leading methodology to gauge and assess climate impact in investment portfolios. Max is a, holds a PhD in history from the University of Cambridge. Uh, Thomas is, in many of our opinions, one of the fathers of the ESG index industry, uh, with a distinguished track record of having worked for KLD risk metrics MSCI, and most recently, True Value Labs, recently acquired by FactSet. Thomas has a PhD in economics from the University of Massachusetts, Amherst. Today's session will center on a topic at the convergence of two mega trends within financial services. The rise of artificial intelligence, machines, big data on the one hand, and the rise of ESG. Uh, the main topic we intend to explore is how the role of the analyst will interact with the role of big data, the role of machines in the futures as pertains to ESG. This is a central topic. And before we pass on to our panelists to start sharing their views, I'd like to initiate a short survey for you all in the audience to be able to say what is your view on this interaction, man versus machine, poll one, if you see it, not all of you will see it as a result of, uh, if you're not, there you go. In your view, the future of ESG research will be dominated by humans, machines, humans with some support of machines, machines with some support of humans, or none of the above. I'll let you uh, click in to this multiple choice. And as we start doing that, maybe we can start going into the meat of the conversation. I'll ask you, Max, and then Thomas to speak to that. ESG ratings, what are we talking about? What is it? Set the context for us and explain to us where this machine, man versus machine question arises. Can we see the results of the first panel? Panelists, can you see them? You can't. No, Maybe no. I can. You mean the results of the polling? Is, it's not up yet, no. Yeah. Now it's up. Interesting. Interesting. We have dead heat <laughs> between humans, support of machines, and support of humans. Perfect. Okay, well, that should make for an interesting conversation. Max. Explain to us, what is an ESG rating? Where is it coming from? What, what is it meant to do? OK, thank you very much. First of all, Roger, Mark, thank you very much um, for the invitation. Um, let me maybe start, since, since we chose this you know, um, heated debate format, uh, with, with a statement from my point of view. I think that um, I have very high hopes for, for artificial intelligence, but I don't think that the type of analysis and ESG rating that we are doing today, bottom up with a deep understanding of the companies, at this point in time can be um, performed by machines. 
and that's my, my opening statement. Let's talk about, um, about uh, ESG ratings. Uh, from my point of view, what is important is that when investors use non-financial information in form of ratings or raw data, they typically use them for different use cases. And um, what I would like to do is to quickly remind you of what those use cases are just roughly. So first of all, there is a difference between, on the one hand, um, the wish of investors to have a certain impact. So, you know, how can I make sure that my money helps or does not harm a certain um, societal target? That's also very much what the regulators are currently focused on quite a bit. And then there's the notion of risk. So the logic, there are certain topics out there that might impact my returns. And the flip side of that, there might be opportunities that I can make money on. So these are kind of two different, um, different approaches that investors have in mind when they uh, use sustainability data to look at their investments. But this looking at the investment also has two sides to it. One is an ex post measurement. So the logic, I invest my money the way I do, and I want to find out what is the climate impact or what is the climate risk, for example, of my investment. So I'm measuring ex post um, what this impact or risk looks like. But there's also the other case that you know houses like, like Selective um, um, make use of, which is how can I use data out there to create new investment products? And be it impact, be it risk, be it ex post measurement or this ex ante feeding into the investment process, it is different type of data that you need. You know, if you if you have, I'm, I'm looking at Tom, we talked before they started about the US election, he had called them right. Um, if you were invested in the fossil industry um, two weeks ago, with the outcome of last week, the impact of these companies haven't changed. But the risk profile might have, because it might be that the new administration is taking a different view on oil, coal, and gas. Right. So um, it's a difference whether you measure impact or risk. And I think this is something um, important to keep in mind. And so when we talk about ESG ratings, we sometimes think of them as one static output that um, that you know one should should run with the other, but that's not the case. You have disclosure ratings, you have performance ratings, you have risk ratings, you have impact ratings, and it's really in the eye of the user of how to use that. I think we will dive into this later. Let me tell you how we um, at ISS ESG work on that. So I'm one of over 400 colleagues at ISS who do nothing but looking at the topic of ES and G. And most of my colleagues, the, the largest majority of colleagues, are analysts. So these are specialists who know the companies that they analyze bottom up. There's a, an analyst for materials who only looks at materials companies and really understands them bottom up. And by that is able to produce um, uh, certain information on, um, on that company and is able um, to rate this, this company. And so when when we think about artificial intelligence, we think about, or, or let's say machine learning in general, we think about how in this process that we have in place, machines can support this in-depth bottom-up analysis. And maybe I, I, I'll finish on that, um, on that thought. So when we look at this, we basically, um, and we, we've started to look at this already actually quite a few years back, and we do have a team that is, of course, based in California, where else, and looks at um, at artificial intelligence and how it can help us. And there's basically, there are basically um, three, three steps that we see. One is that machines can systematically um, identify relevant sources for our rating. And that is something we can expect from machines already today. The second step is um, that machines analyze sources and categorize them. That is working more often than it is not working, but it is actually not as easy as you would think. You know, you, you basically, you tell a machine, this is, here are 300 code of conduct of 300 firms. For the next firm, please find out where the code of conduct is. Not as easy as you would think. Um, and then there's the third step, which would be kind of this, this epiphanic development where we say, and now the machine is creating a you know rating an initial rating and the analyst maybe the analyst just has to approve it or maybe you don't need analysts anymore that look at that and that is 
from our point of view, something that we didn't succeed in doing yet, and we haven't seen that uh, out there in a, in a convincing way. With that, I would like to um, hand back Thomas. to oh. Thomas, this is really a, a good opening for you. Um, Analyst-driven process, some process, some potential is what Max views. What is your take on that? You, you wrote a seminal paper on the topic recently. Uh, well, thank you for saying so, and uh, thank you for inviting me here, Max. Uh, it's nice to be here with you. I, I appreciate your perspective, um, but I have a, a somewhat different uh, point of view. Look, let, let's start from the uh, beginning on ESG ratings. ESG ratings are a sort of a, a mashup of three fundamentally distinct strands of analysis. And it's a little bit like, um, do you want kale or spinach? in your smoothie along with the blueberries and the carrots, right? Um, and and, and um, sometimes it tastes good and sometimes it doesn't. Um, I, so I even think the premise of ESG ratings is, is somewhat questionable. I think, that, I think that they're a useful shorthand, um, but uh, as we go sort of deeper and deeper into um, the sort of the history of ESG investing, they're of limited use on their own. I actually think we've, we're entering into a period where data is becoming more important than ratings themselves. Um, this is sort of the transition from ESG 1.0 to ESG 2.0. And it's the difference between sort of what I'll call outsourced expertise um, where um, uh, asset managers get their views on ESG issues from, um, you know, uh, an, an external firm versus an input into an internal model, which reflects, if you will, their, their house view. But I think, you know, if we look at the big picture and, and look at where ESG ratings came from, um, it, it, it provides some, some perspective on the man versus machine question. Um, because... You know, in the, in the paper on ESG information, excuse me, um, ESG research in the information age, um, one of the things um, one of the things we did is sort of divided the evolution of ESG research into three periods. And the early period was pre-digital; there was very little information. Um, uh, and then as we sort of moved into the period where uh, information became more and more available, sustainability was on the agenda, companies were encouraged to report, um, uh, um, you know, on, on sustainability issues, more and more information became available. And that's the context in which ESG ratings in the early to late 90s and early 2000s came online. We now live in a time when there is so much information on sustainability issues at companies, the only way to make sense of it uh, in, a, in a reasonably timely way is, is using machines. So, so for me, um, uh, I, I would say um, the, the application of artificial intelligence to the collection and analysis, collection and analysis of ESG information um, is not only um, uh, um, uh, inevitable, it's necessary. It's, the, it's really the only way to do it. I, I just want to make one more comment here, which is that, um, you know, if, if you think about the fact that sort of at any point in time, ESG ratings uh, reflected the um, sort of the best information we had um, and the best technology we had. We're now in a different age than we were even five years ago with regard to that. And, and one of the um, things uh, I'm constantly hearing about ESG ratings is that um, on the one hand, they're not transparent. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as to the extent that they're dependent on company reported information, there are there are um, biases there. Um, third thing is timeliness. Um, uh, ratings tend to be, um, as as you put it, based on ex post information and and after the fact. And and lastly, are they salient? Are they, do they really contribute um, effectively to um, uh, investment decisions? And I think that as as we go forward in this discussion, we can pick up on, on some of those comments and criticisms. Thomas, if I, I, I hear you, uh, and I think we all hear you very loud and clear on the role that uh, compute power can bring in gathering information, pre-processing information, even possibly in drawing 
some conclusions from information. What you are saying is not really um, opposite of Max's view, is it? Well, I think I think we both agree that there's a role for um, technology in the, in the process, um, uh, and, and I think it's important to distinguish two two sort of views of what that role is. Uh, I think I think Max effectively described um, uh, the way in which um, uh, traditional ESG research firms. Um, uh, bring technology into their process, which is to, at the, at the front end of the process, to either gather um, information more effectively than they currently, uh, than they have been able to previously, or um, uh, perhaps also searching out new sources of information. Um, and that information is gathered and then it's put into the hands of analysts. And so you're talking about, uh, if you will, improving the existing mo model. Uh, the, an alternative view of the use of um, uh, artificial intelligence in this context is that the analytical expertise doesn't come at the end of the process, it comes at the front end of the process where um, the analysts are working with the engineers to develop the algorithms that, as I mentioned before, not only um, identify um, the information, but also, also analyze it. Um, and I think one of the, you know, going back to my earlier comments, a couple of benefits you get from that is that the information is um, gathered and analyzed and distributed for um, um, investment purposes much faster than it can be um, with a process that depends on, on uh, analysts. And so I, I think that we, um, we, we do agree that um, uh, the technology is, is, is really important these days to uh, improving, uh, improving the process, but, but there, are, there are different ways in which it could be deployed and they have different implications for the overall, um, overall impact. Um, um, on uh, ESG ratings. Wonderful. Yeah, sorry, if I, if I can jump in there. I'm, I'm actually um, disappointingly not disagreeing um, uh, with you. I think this, this notion of analysts helping to train the machine is something that I really appreciate. And that wasn't, you know, we're frank with ourselves, always the value proposition of the artificial intelligence outfits entering the ESG space, where the, you know, in the in the in the early cowboy days, five years back, the, the, the logic was a little bit like fire all your analysts, all you need is data scientists, and you know, um, and that's it. And and I do like um, your your notion to say it is, you know, regardless of where it comes in the in the process, it is an interplay. Um, between between the two of them, so this I think this is a this is an important um, positioning. And having said that, it doesn't have to stay that way, right? It's just an acknowledgement of what is possible today versus what we still expect from this technology. Sorry, Roger, Mark, I was no, 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 absolutely. I think this was a very useful clarification point. A question that came from the audience, but was already on our list of topics we wanted to talk about. Uh, with maybe some fallacies in sometimes how the discussion is set. Max, you talked about several guises and types of ratings, measuring ex post impact, measuring risk, measuring things. A comment that's been made quite often in the press and even uh, was in fact uh, raised a few years ago by, by GPIF uh, in their public pronouncements is, how can we make sense of ESG ratings if they don't have the same output? Uh, in other words, do they need to be standardized or are we talking about something which is very different than the credit space where the objective function you're trying to measure is quite obvious. It is, can company A repay my debt? What's your view on standardization, lack of correlation between ESG indices, is it good? Is it bad? Why is that the case? What's what's your views on this? I mean, I think this is a topic that comes very frequently and is and very relevant. Yeah, and I think um, I, I hope the audience can see the question. So the um, the question is why the the correlation between ESG ratings between different providers is low. And let me let me ask you back. You know, 
if um, I think I think uh, Thomas used a great analogy, which was the smoothie. If I if I may steal that from you, um, if you walk into a shop and you say I would like to have a smoothie, and you walk into the next shop and you say I would like to have your signature smoothie, these smoothies will be different. Yet you wouldn't draw the conclusion that the concept of smoothies is you know flawed because uh, one is not like the other. Well, if you order a water here and a water there, what you're drinking is H2O, so it is the same. And that's a little bit what this comparison of credit ratings with ESG ratings reminds me of. An ESG rating is rolling up hundreds, if not thousands of indicators with a certain view in mind, impact, risk, you know, measurement, uh, steering investments, and so, you know, performance disclosure into one single number. And, and you know, Naturally, this number will differ from one provider to the other. And it is up to the investor to do one of two things. One is to try and understand what the thinking behind the ESG rating is. And let me tell you, those who work with us and those who work with uh, Tom in all his previous jobs have done that for the past years. So this question typically comes from people who are new to the field and, and you know, have, not, have not really understood that even though it is called a rating, it is an ESG rating is different than a credit rating. And I would go further and, and pick up something that um, Tom said at the outset. He said, I think the future is probably not rating, but data. And I agree with that. Um, why? Because we come from a world where there were, you know, three, four um, global ESG rating houses out there. And so that means if you are in the market to buy an ESG rating, you compare three, four against each other, and you try to understand what the view of the world is. Now, that ESG is going mainstream. If you, Roger Mark, you know, use your global, or let's say your European universe, the, you know, your, or your German universe, 30 largest German companies by market cap, and match that with an ISS ESG, ESG rating, your product will look exactly the same as that of your neighbor. And that's what, what asset managers observe right now. You know, the, the products keep st starting to look the same. So you need to bring your DNA into the, um, uh, into the, the rating. So what we now observe is that um, our clients look into what we call custom rating, the more sophisticated ones. You know, they buy um, individual indicators, they roll them up differently than we would do it. So I don't see a trend to harmonization that all the ESG ratings will look the same. I see a trend that the, the, the sustainable rating of a company will look differently from house to house, the same way that the financial rating looks different from house to house because that company is a buy for you and a sell for your neighbor. Tom, what's in you? Great. Well, um, let, let, me, let me start with um, uh, credit ratings. Um, we know that there's, um, you know, over 90% correlation between credit ratings, and yet credit ratings didn't save us from the financial crisis in, in 2008. So maybe, maybe they're highly correlated, but maybe they're also not necessarily as effective as, as we would um, uh, pretend they are. And I would argue that in fact, that that's associated with the, um, uh, with, with the business model there. Uh, I do think um, to, to um, you know, uh, one of the points that's brought up that the low correlation of ESG ratings um, is confusing to people in the marketplace, particularly as Max said, to people who are relatively new to this space, because they, they, if they, they think of rating like a credit rating, and then they get an ESG rating, um, and and they expect that that kind of correlation, but it isn't there. So uh, you know, I think I, he and I have probably agree on this. I think that you know there is a diversity of models. Um, among the uh, uh, rating agencies, there there are therefore diversity of outputs, um, and those outputs then become inputs into the internal models of the um, uh, of the asset managers, um, whether as as you know a rating per se or or a um, uh, or, or data, and you're naturally going to get different results out of out of this out of this whole process, and I think. Um, something else that's happened is that, you know, as we've gone from ESG 1.0 to ESG 2.0, um, one of the drivers is the interest of asset managers to distinguish themselves, um, to, to differentiate their products, frankly. You know, on the one hand, we're talking about um, uh, uh, taking 
um, data and integrating it into distinct investment processes from asset manager to asset manager, but also um, their, their view of sustainability issues uh, are likely to be different. Um, and you you would expect um, you would expect to get different um, you would expect that they would be looking to differentiate their view um, from from that of uh, their their competitors. But uh, you know, going back to this question, um, uh, I, I still think that um, you know a lot of ratings these days are not fit for perfect purpose, particularly because we live in a very fast moving world. Right, and the lack of timeliness on ESG ratings, and I don't know, Max, maybe you could provide some insights into um, sort of how frequently um, uh, the the ratings that I assess are updated. Because um, I'll be honest, I don't know, but I'd be interested in hearing. Um, but I think, generally speaking, the cadence is quite slow. It can be, you know, months to um, up to a year um, for for ESG ratings to change. And um, uh, in a fast moving world, that may not be sufficient um, to guide investment decisions. That's a very interesting question, Max. I mean, is that, do you concur with that? Or, you know, if I may even provide an alternative view, a company doesn't change that much month to month as relates to its impact, right? Because these things take a long time to modify, uh, tr uh, modify the course of action. So at the very least, we would expect some ratings to not vary quickly, no matter the winner uh, ever changing more. Uh, I, no, I would. I mean, the 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 Tom's Tom's point is well taken. There is a new piece of information coming up about a company that might or might not change the rating. Right? We call it a trigger. That is when you know a trigger basically prompts the rating to change, and that information is indeed typically not something that comes from the company itself, right? It's something that you pick up. So that's, I think, where, where the opportunity of artificial intelligence lies and mach machine learning lies. You know, you basically get a real-time trigger that prompts you to look at this piece of information and prompts you to look at your company view and update that if that uh, trigger does that. And we What would be an example, Max? An example of such um, a trick. You have, you, have uh, you know, all of a sudden a blogger in China writes that a chemical, chemical uh, company is um, pumping uh, poisonous chemicals into a river in his neighborhood. You know, this, this could be something that is happening or not happening. You need to check on that and so on. But this would be a piece of information that comes in. It might be true, it might not be true, but it is something where you say, okay, this, this should probably change the positive environmental rating that I have on this company, you know, just to, just to, um, just to say something. Um, and for that, uh, it is indeed, you know, um, the two points that, that Tom made, uh, I, I totally agree with timeliness and dealing with large amount of data is the big opportunity that we have with, um, with machines. The problem with machines is they are currently, artificial intelligence is currently fit for quantity, but not really fit for quality. So you get a lot of false positives in that noise that you create. So in other words, if you are um, constructing an index, you don't have room for a potentially wrong rating, you know? That is, that is tricky from my point of view. So there you need an analyst to look at, you know, kind of um, that universe that has just been, you know, reduced. Everything that happens out there in the world comes at the doorstep of the analyst and she or he decides to, um, to make use of that or not. That step is at least as of today still necessary. You know that from from the from artificial intelligence used in X-rays, right? Artificial intelligence used in X-rays can tell you that a bone is broken without any error, but it might tell you five legs where the bone is not broken yet it says so. So these are the false positives, right? And that is that is great for the doctor because you can you know focus on the ones where you have it, and then you say, oh, we were wrong here, but you know, um, lucky you. Uh, the machine got it wrong, we focus on the ones uh, where the machine got it right. And we will not overlook any patient with a broken leg. That's the same for, for, for company analysis. So it will produce, um, you know, the, 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 it will give you a subset of companies that are, you know, uh, putting chemicals into that river, but it's only true for five, not for 50. And you, if you construct a portfolio based on that, you might exclude 45 companies for something that they've never done. This is a little bit of a simplistic, um, simplistic way, but these false 
these, these errors that are still happening in artificial intelligence across the board, including, by the way, with self-driving cars, the internet is full of, right? So you, if you Google artificial intelligence gone wrong, you find these examples. Every conference on artificial intelligence has kind of a lighthearted ha 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 moment where machines get it wrong. And in many cases, that doesn't matter. But in the case that we have, ESG rating is hard. It's tough. You need to have a view. You need to understand it. There, um, we are not there yet. And that's um, and and we might be there. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to be on record to say we will never be there. But currently, the machines cannot replace um, the human. We'll, we'll we'll do an exit poll later in this discussion to see if you've managed to convince people that indeed the the analyst was uh, you know beats the machine. Uh, the example you gave is an interesting one. It's a uh, it's actually a matter of information um, information asymmetry. So clearly, this information becomes relevant, but it's unlikely that this company had a much better behavior for many years before and suddenly decides to dump chemicals in. Maybe, but it also might not be true, right? So, so something that a machine doesn't do is a dialogue with the company. That's what our analysts do. If you end up with a company in your portfolio that you don't understand why it is there, you call our analyst. You cannot call the algorithm, right? So this is these are all things that are that are still um, in the making, and it's exciting to watch that, you know, because there are you know there's interesting progress everywhere. You've been so eloquent that we need to. I'd like you to Thomas. Yeah, yeah. No, I'd like to uh, just pick up on, on on your point about these are, you know, sustainability issues tend to be longer term issues and, you know, impact isn't going to change a lot from from week to week. But we're not what we're talking about here is keeping current. Um, uh, so, so it's really a matter of of staying uh, staying abreast of what's going on at these companies with regard to sustainability issues. Um, in, in um, a world where the volume and velocity of, of information is just much greater than it's ever been before. And so uh, I, think, I think currency is really important. The other thing is that we also, um, and this is uh, something um, I wrote about with some colleagues um, uh, when I was at True Value Labs, uh, we, we, we live in a day and an age when uh, it's possible for stakeholders to affect the market's view of what's material at companies, and that that that's a re that's a really important change that came about, um, uh, you know, as as the internet came online, and uh, essentially stakeholders got both voice and agency um, in the in the context of the debate over sustainability. So what it means effectively is that. Um, uh, materiality is much more fluid. The, the, the paper we wrote was called Dynamic Materiality. So, so the ability of, of, the, of, the, uh, of, of stakeholders to affect the, the market's perception and valuation of companies uh, is much greater than, it, than it's ever been before. And so that's another reason to, to sort of stay on, on, on top of these issues. I think ultimately that the benefit of artificial intelligence in this context is if it can help investment managers make uh, more informed decisions, right? It's not, you know, I, I'm not an advocate of uh, AI for its own sake um, uh, by any means. In fact, I, I find, um, you know, spell checking um, on my um, uh, an, an indicative, um, uh, in, indicative, um, you know, uh, 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 options, for, uh, you know, um, in my texting, really annoying, right? Okay. So, so you know, right, Tom? <laughs> they're they're like, let's just let's just say that you know we're we're early stage on AI, right? Uh, on the other hand, um, there are a lot of uh, benefits to be gained from it. But I also want to make sure we we don't lose track of an important distinguish uh, distinction between the traditional ESG firms that are adopting that are bringing AI into their process to um, improve, enhance, et cetera, uh, what, what, what they're currently doing, and, and distinguish those firms from um, uh, essentially fintech firms, AI and technology firms, um, 
like um, True Value Labs, which is now part of FactSet, which uses natural language processing and machine learning um, to analyze stakeholder um, uh, perspectives on sustainability, like 427MT, which is um, affiliated with Moody's, which um, uses um, uh, uh, AI to analyze physical risk from climate change, like Bluefield Technologies that uh, looks at emission uh, missions data via satellites and, and, and AI, and another firm, uh, ESGanalytics.ai, which uses geospatial um, data. In other words, there's a whole uh, ecosystem of technology-driven firms that are generating new data sets that can be put into the service of, of, of ESG investing. And I think that's really important here because um, it's not just about you know, one rating versus another rating. It's about it's about um, uh, developing a a richer um, uh, uh, ecosystem of data um, to um, uh, inform these decisions. Thomas, I'd like to ask you to maybe elaborate on that a bit. Uh, you mentioned different uh, models of AI being applied to different either extracting data sets or, or creating outputs that uh, that are significantly different. What's the model that you've has you've mostly seen most recently at True Value Labs? Is it a I guess, tracker and can and sub question here? Can it be gamed? Uh, clearly, that's one of the largest topics in the credit scoring, uh, i.e., credit awarding scoring uh, thing. Are there biases in the AI? Can they be gamed? Do they make mistakes? Um, so can you could you elaborate maybe a bit on on, on these points? Yeah, sure, sure. So um, True Value Labs um, was looking at um, vast amounts is looking at vast amounts of unstructured data using um, uh, natural language processing uh, and machine learning, uh, and so that's that's one, if you will, vector for. Um, artificial intelligence into the, um, uh, you know, into the um, ESG space. Um, so when I when I'm talking about unstructured data, I'm talking about es essentially text documents, right? Um, uh, now, you know what that what that means is that you know there's a particular set or, or there are particular sets of information uh, they can look at and analyze, um, you know. Uh, Using using their framework, which was a which is a SASB framework, um, but it can also be decomposed and reconstructed, um, you know, in various ways along the uh, you know along the lines of what Max maybe, described. Maybe, Tom, maybe explain SASB because I'm not sure everyone everyone knows SASB. SASB, thank you. Um, I hate people who use acronyms and don't explain them. SASB is the uh, uh, um, uh, Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. Um, which is basically an um, industry vetted uh, materiality framework for um, uh, ESG issues. Um, it, it, it is open source. It's it's it it's interesting. It was it was um, developed for company disclosure, but it's really been adopted by um, uh, investors as a basis for. Um, uh, understanding what's material, uh, what's material uh, from a sustainability standpoint. And so, um, uh, uh, SASB, you know, sort of addresses the um, transparency issue. In other words, we 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 have a marketplace where the rating agencies have dis distinguished themselves uh, through the development of proprietary rating frameworks. Uh, and and SASB, by contrast, comes in and, and offers a sort of um, systematic approach to materiality. Now, is it always right? No. Will it evolve? Yes. Um, but in a market that is, uh, I think, seeking standards and that will benefit from certain kinds of standards, um, uh, SASB, you know, I think plays an, uh, plays an important role. Um, well I want to ask a, a rapid question here. I want to also make sure we have uh, time for our panelists. The questions have been piling, and you've answered some of them. Um, we see regulators suddenly getting involved in ESG. We've seen the EU taxonomy uh, work. We've seen uh, some in the US Department of Labor completely opposite direction going, hey, you know, you need to justify why you use ESG. What's your, what's your view on this? I mean, 
which stakeholders should ultimately matter? Um, should it be the service providers, the clients? Is there a role for regulators here? Should I start, Tom? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Look, I, I, I think the, the principle of um, providing greater transparency through disclosure is, is laudable. Uh, I, th I think that's I think that's um, uh, uh, you know important to 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 um, start with. Um, most, um, but not all, of the regulatory initiatives, are, or, or certainly the most uh, influential ones, I think, are coming coming out of the uh, EU, um, uh, and and that's not altogether surprising given the. I would say the sort of cultural and institutional perspective um, in Europe and also uh, its leadership and, and ESG investing over the years. Um, uh, when, it, when it comes to company disclosure, uh, I, I think the idea of having a level playing field for investors and rating agencies, you know, again, is, is a good idea when it comes to fund disclosure. I think uh, protecting investors is, is good, you know, both of these um, uh, get at the, the sort of concerns about, about greenwashing. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I would say generally, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of, of um, greater disclosure, um, uh, and I'm in favor, for example, with the with the rating agencies of, you know, a focus on process rather than outcomes. In other words, if the if the purpose of providing, um, you know, more uniformity or, or more uniform disclosure by rate, ESG rating agencies um, is to um, generate um, a higher a higher correlation of ratings, I'm not in favor of that. If it's to provide more um, clarity to people, um, to investors whose investment products are based on that, uh, I, I am in favor of it. Um, but and I think um, as a rule, what's going to happen is that the regulations coming out of Europe will come will become de facto global standards, um, uh, simply because um, uh, the, you know so many of the asset management firms are are in fact global and they're not going to sort of use different standards in one region than another. Um, uh, I also think that when you look at, um, um, for example, the you know uh, DO, Department of Labor, um, uh, uh, you know rules um, coming out of the U.S. and, and a recent um, SEC uh, ruling on um, um, uh, shareholder um, shareholder proposals that you know are you know trying to actually limit. Um, uh, what can be done with regard to ESG. Um, uh, I actually think that those are likely to change in a new administration. Um, and I think it's unfortunate that, that the, the political winds, um, you know, sort of blow one way and then blow another way. And so, so you know, investors kind of get whiplash um, in that context. But I, I think generally that, um, you know, we do, um, we're, we're in an era when uh, it's, it's, as more and more people get involved with less and less background in this, um, uh, the regulators are, are uh, essentially trying to protect them to um, ensure that uh, uh, they don't get taken advantage of. My big issue with any of this is to do it in a way that um, uh, doesn't um, stifle innovation because, I, again, I think we're, we're at a very early stage on this. And so you, what you don't want to do is codify what, what the status quo today as a model um, for, for um, going into the future. In its infancy, yeah. Max, you want you want to provide perspectives on this? Yes, I would love to. <laughs> so, um, so in, uh, in general, indeed, transparency is great. And just to 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 you know, calm everyone down who's listening in, the regulator doesn't tell you how you should invest your money. The regulator asks you to provide transparency of what the effect is. There is, however, I think in this you know um, regulatory. A momentum out there, there are certain pitfalls where this thing can go wrong. And uh, I think Tom hinted at some of them. So one is um, that uh, in, the, in the attempt to standardize information that the investment industry provides, there's the idea that every assessment has to look the same. Why is it that 
ESG rating A says the company is an A and ESG rating B says the company is a D. That cannot be. So we need to regulate the ESG rating agencies that they come out with the same result. This is, ladies and gentlemen, as if you tell your bar down the, down the road how they have to mix the smoothie so that it can call itself a smoothie. It will be great because every smoothie will taste the same and it will be terrible because there is no competition for the best smoothie out there. And that's what will happen in the ESG space. So, um, so this, is, this is a direction where this can go, um, go wrong. The other is the focus on greenwashing. So a lot of the regulation is currently driven by the thought, oh my God, there might be funds out there that say they're green, but they are not. We need to get these foul apples because if we get them and we take them out of the market, everyone will invest in ESG solutions because it's the foul apples that prevent them from doing so. That is not the case. There might be some foul apples out there, but most self-declared green funds try to be generally green. They might fail in it, but they try it. Greenwashing is not our problem. Our problem is the entire part of the market, in brackets, you know, 95%, that is not trying to address the topic, uh, the, the societal topics that we are dealing with. So there's a derailing happening. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that now that the regulator is there, the lobbyists are there as well. And a lot of lobbyists are trying to maintain the status quo. They see that this is their role. And they're by that not always representing the opinion of their members. So um, let me pause here, but this is, you know, um, there are other areas as well. In general, um, good, uh, good direction with certain uh, dangers that it might um, not achieve what it is supposed to achieve, including, and now I said I will stop and I won't, including that the regulator talks about impact and the investment industry talks about risk. And very often the regulator, uh, they, they think that they talk about the same thing, and so the regulator, by the regulation that they put out there, do not or might not have a real impact on the economy out there because it doesn't translate that way. <sighs> Sorry. We have, we have tons of really um, nice questions from our attendees. And, you know, we have about 20 minutes left. I wanted to maybe try to go through a few of them um, and get some rapid fire about them. One of them, which is probably the longer standing question in the ESG world is, is the following. Um, does ESG, uh, how do you respond to statements from ESG index providers that ESG generates alpha in portfolios? Or in other words, let's even simplify that one. Um, is there alpha value in ESG? And by the way, I'm a French student. I will believe in information. <laughs> Uh, discovery doesn't really generate alpha because information markets are perfect. Is there value in ESG? How do you, how do you reconcile this, uh, this? Is there alpha in ESG and how you capture it? Tom, you don't so spend ten, 10 hours about it. Try to give the two or three points because it's easy to spend a lot. The, the, I, I think the, the way to think about that question is, is whether or not um, uh, ESG is a compensated factor in the same sense that, you know, low volatility and momentum are the traditional, uh, the, the traditional investment factors. Um, and it comes, <laughs> ironically or, or not, it comes back to the question of whose ratings are you using? Right? Because you can use one set of ratings, uh, run an analysis, um, take another set of ratings, get a different set of companies, and end up with different results. And so, I and I think that that um, as compared to uh, traditional investment factors, which are based on traditional on on a you know sort of um, quantitative uh, uh, financial metrics, um, you you um, there there is there is more variation. Um, generally speaking. Uh, I, I think it's a portfolio construction question, and um, and and from that context, uh, there is pretty strong evidence that you get, for example, um, more resilience, lower drawdown, um, uh, um, and and less downside risk um, in ESG portfolios than than you do in traditional portfolios, regardless of the information sources. So I would say broadly, it is definitely additive. To the investment process, whether it's um, uh, um, adding alpha or reducing risk, it's contributing to better risk-adjusted returns. Great. Interesting question here. I mean, Max, you, you want to provide 
the fundamental perspective to this? Well, let's try to take a few more questions so that every, you know, many people. It's fine. The, this, um, that is interesting. When I tried to allude to it before, when it comes to tech analysis, don't we run into the risk of a sort of SEO optimization? In other words, will companies start gaming the AI? So this is, and, and uh, Tom, you're probably better equipped to speak to that, but I just wanted to, um, wanted to hint at the fact that there is a, a discussion going on out there that you, Tom, commented on that basically goes along the lines of, do companies adjust the way they talk knowing that machines are listening? So can I basically put certain words, certain frames into my text so that the machine um, uses that as a generally positive notion or avoids a negative notion. And uh, so, so to, to, to frame this, there is a, uh, there are interesting articles on that that we can also send you, but uh, Tom, what's your... What's sure. Your well, I, I, would, I would start by observing, and, and this was, um, uh, you know, and one, of, one of the things we did at True Value Labs um, is that um, we just looked at external sources of information. So in other words, you know, there was, um, I would say, concern enough that publications by companies, let alone, um, you, know, uh, 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 you know, scripted transcripts um, would be biased um, uh, in favor of the companies in any case. Um, uh, I, I think that the, the um, possibility of, um, you know, being gamed is there. Uh, as a rule, the more information is collected, the less any single piece of it um, has an influence on the on the perspective uh, generated by it. And so um, it's really a, a sort of a, a large numbers versus small numbers game. If you have a, a limited amount of data and some of it comes from companies, um, it's likely to be um, it's likely to, to um, have an impact if 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 the particular perspective put out by the company is is integrated into a substantial set of data it's it's going to be uh, less important in the overall perspective and maybe maybe to add on that I something that um, in preparation for today our uh, artificial intelligence had um, explained to me again was the new oil in the artificial intelligence sphere is training data. So it is the, the model itself is of course important and the platform around is important, but what really makes a difference is the training data. So if you want to train a, a, a self-driving car, the difference between a cat and a dog, that's a very uh, often used example, anybody can do that. You can do that, I can do this, I know the difference, we tell the algorithm, this is a cat, this is a dog, this is a cat, this is a cat, this is a dog. And in the end, the, at some point, the machine is able to differentiate between cats and dogs, even though they've never seen that cat or that dog. For something like an ESG rating or an ESG analysis, this is of course much more complex. You need what the artificial intelligence industry refers to as the domain owners. So those who understand what they're talking about. And just to give you an idea, um, Tom talked about satellite data, something that we, um, that we uh, look at as well, right? If you have a satellite image of a city and you want to understand what is a warehouse versus what is an office building versus what is a factory, you need basically somebody who tells your algorithm for 50,000 other factories that this is a factory until the algorithm is able to do that. So you need somebody who's able to read houses from above. I couldn't do that. I see a flat roof. You know, you need experts for that. And, um, and so, you know, while um, fudging of algorithms is maybe something that can happen, I think this is almost a problem that we have to think about in step two, because step one is still, you know, this huge challenge ahead of us. Okay, Dr. Mark, we can't hear you. You're mute. Very really interesting perspective. I was, I was uh, pondering. Very, very interesting. We we have we have five more minutes, and I was hoping if I could ask you a question. If you come from the asset management industry, only a few years ago, CEOs typically said, "Oh my God." ESG, I hear a lot about that. What do I need to do about this? And, and still today, a lot of players in the industry are new to the game. Oh, I must have a rating. I must use one. What's the best rating out there? What's your advice to 
any professional investor, manager of investment management firm, when they approach ESG, when they approach ESG, ESG ratings today. The sub-question to that is, what's your advice? It's not a sub-question, a separate one, but same strand of thought. What would you say to graduates today who are studying? What do you want them? What do, what do we say? You want to get involved in ESG? Do this. What is this? Two questions. What do you recommend to a company manager? What do you recommend to a graduate who wants to get involved in ESG? I'll, I'll, I'll um, start and, and try and be brief. To companies, I would say in the absence of um, a regulation on disclosure, uh, get your, um, uh, uh, have your disclosures audited. Give them that credibility, okay? I think, I think there's a real credibility issue um, on, on company disclosed information. And I say that not to disparage the efforts they're making because I know a lot of, um, a, a lot of time and resources go into this, but just because um, uh, it tends to uh, uh, overemphasize positive rather than negative news. Um, when it comes to graduates, um, this field is um, 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 humming these days. Um, there are lots of opportunities, uh, you know, that one angle is to come in more from the technology side, right? I mean, we've been talking about machines and machine learning and, and different, different approaches to um, uh, artificial intelligence and its application in this context. Um, I, I would say, you know, it used to be you need to be conversant in the ESG issues. Then you needed to be conversant in investment in ESG. Now you need to be conversant in technology investment in ESG. Um, and so um, uh, all I can say is there are uh, great opportunities and a lot of really smart people coming into the field these days. And it's embedded across um, or becoming embedded across uh, curricula in universities, in the CFA, uh, et cetera. It's becoming a part of the fabric of mainstream finance. Max. Companies in-house, um, ESG expertise, ESG literacy. Um, graduates apply to ISS ESG. <laughs> <laughs> After they've applied to Selective, uh, you know, we... And if you, if, and if you build in-house expertise, don't hire your experts from us, please. Need them. Because <laughs> machines can't replace well, them. As yet. long as you don't do the same to us or our portfolio companies, we're happy. I, I would like to ask our technicians in, in the back room, uh, Scotty is his name, um, could you, could you maybe launch as a, as a closure to this webinar the, the first survey we, 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 we had, which was about the role of man machine? Let's see who won here, who twi twisted the opinion one way or the other. And, and why we do that, so why we, I, I can't see it yet, um, but why we do that, I wanted to, um, I wanted to uh, thank, of course, Selective, but also say it shouldn't be man versus machine. It should be you know persons versus processors. Um, luckily, this is un unlike this panel uh, indicates. This is not a man-dominated industry, and it shouldn't be. Man or woman? Right. Um, I can't see the votes. I'm hoping that our participants are able to vote, and we'll we'll see who the winner for. The, 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 who had the best rebuttal if, if the magic 50-50 evolved one way or the other. I, I, I'm actually fighting for humans with some support of machines just to make that clear. I don't know, Tom, maybe you do the same. Um, uh, well, I, I, I think the heavy lifting is going to be done by the machines. And I think uh, the, humans, the humans will be critical, actually, at both ends of that process, quality checking at the uh, output end and um, um, sort of driving the algorithm development at the front end. Um, so Definitely. it's not it's not either or. And again, ultimately the test is: can um, machines, can artificial intelligence help human beings make better investment decisions? We have a winner: humans with some support of machines. Interesting. Um, I guess Max wins. I would like to thank my mother who participated. Okay, very good. Max wins the argument. That doesn't mean Max is right. Uh, we respect all opinions. And there's a lot of truth in many different things that combine together. Uh, I'd like to thank you both for, for the very uh, engaging conversations. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much for participating and, and being very truthful and honest and 
and li uh, live in the debate. Uh, thank you for our participants for joining in. Uh, a replay will be available um, on our website, I believe, uh, shortly. Uh, so I encourage you to uh, send a link to those friends of yours or colleagues of yours who might not have joined. Thank on behalf of all Thank you. Thanks very on much. On behalf of all of us, thank you very much. All the best, bye-bye.